I guess I let the cat out of the bag as to what I'm speaking about today. I am uh, bringing a message to you from the book of 2 Chronicles. And the text for this morning's message is 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Sometimes in life we make mistakes. No one's exempt. You all know what I'm talking about, right? All of us make mistakes. Bad decisions, and then after we make these decisions, we're faced with the prospect of what we're going to do next. And today I'd like to speak with you about one of Judah's righteous kings, if you look in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles 20. Now, God has given us the examples of people and leaders to show us how things go in our lives when we uh, do what is wrong. I'm getting a real ringing here. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, God has given us examples of people and leaders to show us how things go in our lives when we do what is wrong. But we also see positive stories that show us how wonderful it is when a person commits themselves to wholeheartedly serving uh, God. And today I would like to use the life of King Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, as an example. And in the case of King Jehoshaphat, if you read 2 Chronicles chapter 18 and 19, in 2 Chronicles chapter 18 and 19, we see the story of how King Jehoshaphat, or he uh, was the leader of, of Israel, or sorry, of Judah, and what he did was he did what was wrong before God. He entered into an unholy alliance with the wicked king Ahab of Israel. And Jehoshaphat and the armies of Judah, they experienced a punishing defeat when they did this against the Amalekites. And the Amalekites defeated them. And Jehoshaphat received a stern rebuke from God's prophetic messenger. But what is refreshing to see is that rather than be hardened further to disobey the Lord, when Jehoshaphat was confronted by this punishing loss and the message of the prophet, he repented of his sin, and he learned his lesson, and he began to do what is right before God. And soon after this defeat uh, from the Arameans, a new threat, or I should say the Amalekites, a new threat to Judah arose. Jehoshaphat was faced with a crisis in his kingdom. His reaction to this crisis is the text of my sermon this morning, understanding God's plan for overcoming. So if you follow in with me in your Bibles or on the screen here, 2 Chronicles 20, starting with verse 1. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Buenites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some of the people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hezion Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So the good news is that when Jehoshaphat was confronted over the sin he'd committed wrongfully by forging this alliance and going into battle with King Ahab, Jehoshaphat, he repented of his sin, of self-reliance, and he led his people 
back towards God. Now, in Jehoshaphat's time, Judah was surrounded by enemies. And after this defeat suffered by the Amalekites, the time came when these Moabites, Ammonites, and Munite nations decide that they are going to attack Judah. I'm not going to get into who these people were. They're the first two tribes that I mentioned were descendants of Lot, but, and the other one was um, a tribe that was in the land that had formed this alliance. Upon learning the threat against his kingdom, Jehoshaphat, he was very much alarmed. We read in the scripture here. He was alarmed because he knew that formerly he had been defeated because he had acted foolishly and, and God had not blessed his endeavors. He was also alarmed because the enemy coming against him was vast in number and was powerful. And Jehoshaphat recognized the vulnerability of his nation, but he had learned from his past errors. And instead of turning to his own devices to try and figure out a plan to fight the force that was coming against them, Jehoshaphat recognized that there was no help that would come except from God, and he turned his face towards the Lord. He called upon the people to cease what they were doing. He proclaimed a fast for everyone in the land to encourage the people to seek the Lord for help. And the people, they responded, it says, all of them from one end of the territory of Judah to the other, actively seeking the Lord for help through prayer and through fasting. Now today, similarly to what we see with Judah in this scripture, the church of Jesus Christ has enemies on all sides. Hillside Community Church is not an exception. There has been an enemy that has been mobilized to attack us here, along with other Bible-believing churches in this nation. Although in our case, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood enemies like these three tribes that came against Judah, we are re wrestling against um, principalities and spiritual powers of darkness that do not have physical form. These are our true enemies. You see, the devil and his minions want to destroy and uproot the blessing of God over the lives of his holy people and bring the promised land that God has given us into captivity. See, our, our spiritual enemies out there, they hate the church. They detest seeing people set free from their addictions, vices, and surrendering, surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ. They detest seeing the strength of God's people living out their lives in love collectively and effectively in obedience to what God has called them to do. The spiritual enemies that come against us, they try to sow discord. They try to stir it up so that we're ineffective. And they try to use people who are not walking closely with God to further their end goal. This is why we see oftentimes a human face to the frontal attack that the church um, receives. We see a human face behind it. But, but what's behind the face is the principalities and powers of darkness that are trying to... Um, trying to take our land, put us into captivity. So, but when you see that human face, don't forget, that's just the face. Okay? That's not your true enemy. Your true enemy is what's whispering in their ear and causing them to do what they're doing. Jehoshaphat was alarmed when he learned that this vast army of enemies was coming against him. He knew that this army outnumbered his forces. He understood this. He had received word from the scouts who had bought, brought back reports. The enemy was prepared, they, the scouts said. They were prepared for battle and bent on Judah's annihilation. Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah had plenty of reason to be afraid in the flesh. Absolutely everything Absolutely everything that had been built in the land God had given to them was at risk. And Jehoshaphat knew what it was to taste defeat in battle because of his former disobedience. But he also knew that when he had suffered defeat, it was because of his disobedience. And he turned to the Lord. 
like Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah. The church today is God's representative here on the earth. We're his representatives. We are a city on a hill, a body that shines the light of God into the dark corners of our society. We are the light of the world, as the scriptures say. Hillside Community Church, there is no doubt that your enemy has all of us collectively in his crosshairs. He longs for us to be rendered ineffective and to steal away our inheritance. What is our inheritance in this land, you might ask? Can't take away our salvation. We're bought with a price. Right? We're secured in the Lord. Can't take away that. So what is this inheritance that he desires to steal away from us? It is our freedom to worship God. It is the people of the caribou that God desires to be saved, delivered, and healed. And those people, God has asked us and tasked us and commissioned us to shine the light of his love into their lives so that they can see Jesus living inside of us. That's what the enemy wants to disturb and interfere with. Because he knows that if he can overtake the land and render the, the church ineffective and unproductive in their knowledge of Christ, those people will not turn to the Lord. And they'll be in chains of darkness. The land will be covered in darkness. Now, God has called us to participate with him in the venture, in the venture of sharing his gospel with them. Our enemy is bent on keeping that from happening. Now, King David once was told by God prophetically concerning the mission of the Messiah who would one day come as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. David was told this in Psalm 2, 7 and 8, I will proclaim the decree spoken to me by the Lord. You are my son, today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possession. See, it's important for us to see this through the eyes of the Spirit of God. We are the inheritance the Lord uh, has talked about here prophetically. It has come to pass. We are the inheritance of the Lord who are at the ends of the earth. That's us. We're God's possession. Jesus died on the cross, raised from the dead, and commissioned the apostles to go forward and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We are the ends of the earth. This prophecy has been fulfilled, and we're the fruit of it. Like Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah who are called to dwell in and possess this land that God has given us, we are ambassadors of the message of hope. We are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And Jesus desires to see people bound in darkness in the caribou set free. He longs to see that. And he calls us to be his ambassadors as though God was speaking through us, right? We appeal to you. Paul says this. God wants to appeal through you to continue to build his kingdom here to the ends of the earth. We're at the ends of the earth. We're at the last days too. The time is short. Jesus is coming soon. So, like Jehoshaphat's enemy who was strategically moving to defeat him and place the land in their captivity and to pillage it, we also have this enemy that's mobilizing to try and defeat us and pillage us. And the enemy has different faces. Just like this, this group of, of people that hated the Israel or hated Judah and wanted to see them defeated, there's three separate armies. Different faces joining together to come at the people of God, to try and take away their, their promised land, to, to enslave them, to make them ineffective in their own land. 
Well, when you think about all the enemies of the gospel that are out there, that we have to face, it can be a little bit overwhelming, can't it? It can be a little bit more than just a little bit discouraging. It's, it's heavy. There's some darkness out there, and it's trying to destroy what God has given us. And that is the witness to see uh, many sons come to glory here, right here. That's when we, bring, when we drill it down and bring it to this level right here. That's what it is. See, we're, we're not just churchgoers just to kind of sit here. We're, we're part of the church of Christ to obey the Lord. And, and what, is, what, does, what is pleasing to the Lord? That people come to him and repent of their sins and are set, people that are set free to become part of the wheat that's gathered into his barn at the end of the age. That's his heart. That's his desire. He's bent on it. And he wants us to be bent on it too. So we have to. We have to acknowledge the fact that our enemy wants to discredit us, wants to disturb, wants to keep us from being effective presenters of the gospel of Jesus Christ that will bring the harvest into the barn. When we're tested by an impending enemy invasion on our turf, there are several wrong responses that we can have to this impeding assault that's coming our way. And we see it. It's all over. There's several. I'm just going to talk about three of them. There's probably more. But there's three key responses that are wrong. Firstly, there is a fear response. We can try to run. We can try to hide and put our heads in the sand, ignoring the fact that our enemy is advancing towards us. And sometimes it's like, I don't want to think about it. It's just too much to think about this enemy. You know, so just, I'd just rather not think about it. I'd rather not acknowledge it. Let's just go about our daily activity. Um, dee -dee -dum, dee -dee -dum, dee -dee -dum. Like nothing's happening. Hide our head in the sand and hope it goes away. It's not going to go away. No. We can try to run and hide in the sand. Saying it over and over to ourselves that there is no danger. Ignoring all the warning signs and refusing to see that there is a real problem will not make the problem better. It will not make us effective in what God has called us to do. For people who approach things this way, the thought of there being an imp uh, impeding attack is so terrifying that we continue to live our lives as if there is no enemy and there is no attack. But the scouts say otherwise. The scouts say otherwise. They've seen the armies gathered. And they've seen them marching towards our territory. What are we going to do? They've heard that these armies that are coming at us are bent on our destruction. Secondly, second wrong response. When we realize what is being mobilized against us, we can try to face the struggle in our own strength by bunker digging, mobilizing, gathering, and mustering our own resources and developing our own strategies through human wisdom to defend our positions and fight in the coming war that's coming our way. There's no denying that the war is coming, but we rely upon our own strength. We rely upon our own wisdom, the wisdom of man. Thirdly, the third one, we might even be tempted to make unholy alliances with people who are not right with God to fight what's coming at us. These are the Ahabs, the Israelites who have gone apostate and are embroiled in false teaching and adultery. We consider them brethren in our cause because we have a similar enemy. And so we accept their invitation to fight alongside with them in the battle. In the flesh, we see these Ahabs as having some strength in their ranks to help us in our position because we have a common enemy. But the alliances formed with the apostate Ahabs will do nothing but make things worse. Nothing that we can do by forming alliances like this will work. Why? Because those so-called allies are not right with God. And they do not enjoy his favor. God will not bless our battle strategies when we do this. So, if those things, 
three things in mind. When the enemy approaches, if we pursue war with those three strategies that I've just mentioned here, we will certainly be defeated in the battle, and the enemy will oppress us, and we'll place our land in darkness and captivity. The reality is this. When it comes to fighting the large army that is mobilizing towards us on this front, just like Jehoshaphat, we need to recognize they are too powerful for us to hide from. They are too powerful for us to overcome by using our own devices and strategies. They're too powerful for us to be de get desperate and start to ally ourselves with those who are not right with God, who do not follow his word. God desires that rather than making our own plans or depending on others to fight with us, God desires that we turn instead to him for deliverance. When the enemy is threatening our territory, we need to forget about trying to trounce him through our own feeble resources. We need to ask God, have mercy upon us and save us. See, God, God delights when we turn to him for our strength to face the day. He delights in it. Jehoshaphat didn't make the same mistake this time as he did the first time when he went with Ahab. He recognized that for there to be victory, the battle needed to be fought through intervention from the living God. He didn't know how all that was going to work, but Jehoshaphat did what was right before God. He called his people to prayer and to fasting. When we are called out to, when we call out to God to interfere in dire, interfere, intervene rather in dire circumstances that we're facing, we would do well to do the same. The God of Jehoshaphat is the same God that we serve. It isn't as if prayer and fasting make us more worthy to be blessed or to do God's work. It is that prayer and fasting draw us closer to the heart of God. And they put us more in line with God's power. Fasting is a powerful expression of our total dependence on the Lord. This is why scripture promises us. Now, God gave this promise to Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7.14, it's a very well-known scripture. When Solomon was inquiring of the Lord and was establishing the temple, Solomon was given this message, If my people who, which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now this promise is powerful. And it's applicable in the circumstances that we face today as well. But we should also understand that the scripture was given to King Solomon. And it was accompanied by a solemn warning that if they did not humble themselves before God, but turned to false gods instead of the one true God, that they would face peril, captivity, and would be uprooted from the land that God had given to them. And sadly, we know the history book. Sadly, Solomon did not take the promises of God to the core of his heart. And he spent his final years distant from God. Captivated by foreign women and false gods. The result for the nation was catastrophic. Solomon's kingdom was divided, and, and we see this in the story. How that's how there was Israel and Judah. That's why there's the split between the two. If only we could learn from history and turn to the Lord for our help instead of hiding, instead of turning to ourselves and our own resources or, or forming unholy alliances with the wrong people. 
If only we could have the heart of Solomon's great-grandson Jehoshaphat and learn from mistakes that we have made in the past. The enemies of Judah who wanted to wage war against Jehoshaphat, they had a vast army. And they were confident that they had the force necessary to defeat, defeat Judah. Don't you hear the saber rattling out there? The cockiness of the evil one speaking through the talking heads? What's really interesting is in all of this, you can see through the history of Judah and Israel that, the, that as the leaders of the nation went, so went the nation. The leadership of the church is called to pursue battle in the same way that Jehoshaphat faced impending battle, and that was to fall to their knees and bow their faces to God and cry out to him to deliver them. Jehoshaphat was humble before God, and he prayed publicly before all the people so that the leadership of the people would follow suit and would also, and the people would follow the leaders and the whole nation bow before the God of heaven, humble themselves, pray, and seek his face. In verse 5 we read, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard, and he said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O oh God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it. They have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or the plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name. And we'll cry out to you in our distress. And you will hear and you will save us. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us for an inheritance. Our God, you will, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And all the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. My friends, Jehoshaphat, he humbled himself before God and he cried out to God to rescue them from the threat that they were powerless to stand against. Jehoshaphat acknowledged God's sovereign power over the universe. He acknowledged the faithfulness of God and the provision of God in giving them the land that they were inhabiting. He acknowledged the people's frailty and their inability to stand against this vast army that was coming up against them. He also acknowledged that collectively, they did not know what to do. And the only thing they knew what to do was to keep their eyes on him. You see, we see in this story an agreement with the promises of the words that were given to Jehoshaphat's great-grandfather Solomon. Jehoshaphat and all the people humbled themselves before God. They prayed and sought his face. They acknowledged their limitations and their inability to stand on their own. They were not haughty. They did not look for human solutions by forging alliances with those who were not right with the Lord, nor did they hide and pretend that nothing was wrong. They recognized that an enemy was mobilizing against them, and they waited on the Lord. This is the pattern God establishes for his people in times of trouble. We are children of the Lord, children of a heavenly Father that dearly loves us. And as a church, we're facing uncertain times. In the physical realm, we can see the enemy with face carrying the spiritual realm with them. An attack line that comes against us. But God is calling us to have the same spirit as Jehoshaphat in, fa in facing impeding battle. This can be regards to an enemy advance to attack our marriages. 
our family, our church, or even our, our community as a whole. It can be the enemy trying to silence our testimony for Jesus, or it can be an attempt to burn all of our resources so that we can't effectively carry out our mission. But we as God's holy people, we do not serve an idol. We do not serve an imaginary figurehead that's been made up by the minds of man. We serve the living God of Abraham. We serve the living God of Jehoshaphat. The one who is able to do much more than we can even ask or imagine. When God says it shall be done, it shall be done and nothing on earth can stop it. And he has opted to partner with his holy people to allow us the privilege of participating in his good work. Therefore, the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective, the Bible says, because God has ordained it as such. He can do it another way. He doesn't need us. God can just speak and it's done. He has chosen to have his people, his holy people, humble themselves and pray and seek his face. That's his plan. <laughs> the enemy might try to silence our testimony for Jesus. He might try to burn out our resources so that we're not effective in, in sharing the gospel with the people that need to hear. He might try to do all that stuff. But when we cry out to the Lord, the tables turn. <laughs> There's no power out there, no matter how oppressive and how big it is, that can stand against the living God. 14, then the spirit of the Lord came on Jeziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but it is God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them there at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. So being true to the promise of his word, we see Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah humble themselves and pray. They sought God and he had mercy on them. He did not abandon them in the midst of their distress. He answered them through a timely word of prophecy. God did not have to give them a word. He did this to encourage them to know the battle would be won, but it would not be through their own doing. They wouldn't even have to pick up a sword against the enemy. The battle was the Lord's. The enemy has no authority to come against the heart of God unless God permits it for refinement's sake. And Jehoshaphat had a humble heart. He was willing to let go of his own plans to fix things. Jehoshaphat bowed down, it says in verse 18, with his face to the ground. And all of the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshipped before the Lord. Then some of the Levites from the Koalites and the Korites stood up and praised the Lord, the praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. <laughs> they praised the Lord. The battle hadn't even been had taken place yet. And what did they do? They praised the Lord because of the word given to them through the prophet. And they believed the word of God. There were a number of ways God could have defeated these armies, but he appointed a way that de demanded the participation of faith of the believers. The, the people of Judah were called by God not just to sit in their homes. They were called to God, by God to mobilize and to go. But then they were said, watch and see what I do. There was a faith partnership that they had with God. God wanted them to mobilize, go out and face the enemy and see what he would do in delivering them. And God will often let the enemy 
He'll often let the enemy come in very close proximity to our camp before finally he brings his deliverance. We might see the dust of their feet as they're approaching. You see this repeated over and over again, you know? The Israelites when they were delivered from Egypt, right? We see this over and over and over again. Lifting of the hands and the battle going in their favor because of their obedience. Jehoshaphat and the people responded in faith. They fell down before the Lord and worshiped before him. And then some of them stood up and praised him in a very loud voice. The response of the word of the Lord and his promise of deliverance was enough to invoke worship and praise. On a national scale, all of the people of Judah joined in. The deliverance had not happened yet, but God had given them this joy in their hearts to know that God's promise had been made and that victory was sure. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Does that sound familiar? Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. That's where this comes from. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. And as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. And after they had finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert, now if you picture Israel, Jerusalem's on a hill and there's this valley that leads down into the Dead Sea, down in there. And that's where these armies, had, they were going to come up through this corridor and attack Jerusalem. But the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. Um, so Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off, oh sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked towards the vast army, what did they see? All they saw was dead bodies laying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder. And they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, much more than they could carry. Much more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. And this is why it's called the Valley of Baraka to this day. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem. For the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. The fear of God came upon all of the surrounding kingdoms when they heard of how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for God had given him rest on every side. God fought on behalf of his people by throwing the enemy into confusion and turning the enemy upon himself. The defeat of the armies against Judah was miraculous and it was thorough. The men of Judah, they, they mobilized to go forward towards the front as they were not sure how God was going to do this. But they trusted him to rout the enemy he said that they wouldn't have to fight, and they went forward. And not only had the enemy destroyed themselves, but the men of Judah who went to investigate what occurred found the plunder laying all around. It says in verse 25, right? So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off all the plunder, and they, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, much more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. My friends, when we obey the Lord and do things His way and humble ourselves before Him and pray and seek His face, He will fight our battles. And we will be surprised to find that in place of the destruction of our land that the enemy was planning, 
the Lord will actually turn the circumstances around meant to destroy us, to bless us. And we will see the provisions of our defeated enemies and will gather them into the place where we can put them to use for the glory of the kingdom of God in continuing to establish his kingdom in the land that he's given us to possess. So they were strengthened in the end. My friends, I don't know what it is that each person is facing here. Each of us has different things, but we also have collective things that we're facing. This is a template for us to follow. The word of God in the Old Testament is given to us to teach us lessons on what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And in this case, this lesson is shown to us to teach us what we should do. And the effect of that resonates into eternity. See? There's people outside of the walls of this assembly that God is calling. And you, my friends, are his ambassadors. God has planned for you to be involved in his work and to meet people out there that will turn to Jesus. And God wants us to be strong. He wants us to be together. He wants us to pray and to seek his face for deliverance. Until we're ready to let go of our own devices and, in any, and stop hiding and stop forming alliances with un, people that are apostate and are not close to God, until we're willing to do that and just come before him, okay, we're going to be under threat that our land is going to be taken captive. God, I believe, has a message for us. His desire is that we go forth in power here, that we're filled with the Spirit, that we march with the love of God as our banner so that they might see who we are so that they might see the work that Jesus does in reforming lives. All of us here are sinners. We need Jesus. We can't face that enemy outside of our own, uh, uh, on our own strength. We can't do it. It's not going to work. We just need to stop. I'm calling God's people during this time that we're facing right now. I'm calling you to pray. And I'm calling you to fast in obedience to what we see here as a template. As your pastor, I want to see us all follow the word of the Lord. Because I know that he's true to his word. And when we do this, God will give us victory. Amen. Would you bow in prayer? And could I get the music team to come forward? Jesus, Lord, we come to you as a people that are in need. Lord, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do in the perilous times that we're facing. God, we don't know what to do about the fires that rage outside of the borders of our community that threatens our homes and our church and everything. We don't know what to do about this. So, Lord, on behalf of our community and on behalf of of this land that you've placed us in, we call out on you, Lord, to have mercy and protect us. God, we pray that you'd turn these fires back on themselves and that they would not harm us. God, we pray for our enemy and the system that's out to get us. It's out to make it so that we can't preach the gospel. We can't live lives that are free. We pray, Lord, that you would rout the enemy before us. We desperately need you, Lord, because we don't know what to do. So we come before you. 
We ask that you do your work. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. Actually, we don't even have the ability to do that because latent within each one of us is this nature that sends, tends to rise up. So, Lord, we pray that you give us grace. Grace to live by. Grace to, to be humble. Grace to lay down our ideas before you. God, we pray that you would do a miracle. God, we pray that the pews in this church and in all the Bible-believing churches in this community would be filled with people that are repenting, that are coming to you, Jesus. We pray, God. These are the last hours, Lord, and we know that you called us to be salt and light. Help us to be that effectively. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we get it wrong, because we do. Just like Jehoshaphat did, Lord, sometimes we get it wrong. Help us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.